Again, this is David Crosby, and I'm at Belhaven University to interview Betty Quinn about her connections with uh, Wells Methodist Church as part of an oral history project. And Betty, let me ask you once again, do I have your permission to uh, conduct this interview? You do. Thank you. Um, you uh, have been a resident of Jackson since 1935. And That's right. I, I'm wondering, in, in terms of religion, d did you grow up as a Methodist? Uh, my family was always Methodist. I, the first 10 years of my life, I went to a Presbyterian church because we lived next door to it okay. on South uh, State Street. But then um, the Methodist church was the first church I joined. And how old were you when you joined? I was 12 when I joined Wells. And, uh, and can you give us a year for that? Yes, 1947. 47, mm -hmm. okay. I was 12. I went to Wells when I was 10 but um, and wanted to join the church then, but my mother felt that children shouldn't join the church till they were 12 because that's how old Jesus was when he went to the temple. She thought that was the appropriate age for children to join the church. I see. And did the rest of your family join uh, the same church, or was this an individual decision on your part? Well, they all eventually joined Wells, too. Uh, my parents had been members of a Methodist church in uh, Simpson County, you know, before they came to Jackson. But eventually, everybody joined Wells. And uh, was there anything in particular that attracted you to Wells? Well, I was a little girl, you know, just 10, and one of my little friends invited me to come to her Sunday school, and I went, and then I felt it was such a friendly church that I continued going there, and my family was real happy because it was a Methodist church, and they had traditionally been Methodist. We had just moved to that street, you know, when I was 10. And as you grew older, were there other things about the church that began to appeal to you? Well, we had a really great preacher in my youth growing up. His name was Bob Case. And we had a real great uh, youth group there. We had a youth choir. And in those days, everybody went to the same high school. You know, so we were all together, both at church and in school. So that was really a good thing. Well, now that you've mentioned High school, I wonder if you would mind telling me um, where you went to school, uh, grade school, middle school, high school, whatever. I started school at Lee, which was on South State Street at the time. And then I, when I was 10, we moved to uh, Bailey Avenue and I went to Galloway. I finished the elementary school at Galloway. And then I went to Bailey Junior High, which was one of two high schools in town at the time. And then I went to Central, which was the only school for white children in the town. Lanier was the only school for black children in town. So there was just one high school for each group. So Bailey for middle school, and then on to Central for high school? Yes. And at that time, there was only one high school for whites? In Just one. And our class of 54 is the largest class that's ever graduated from a high school, I think, in Mississippi. Because the year after we graduated, they built Murrah and Provine and Jim Hill and Brinkley. You know, so they built two more white schools, two more black schools. So then the town had many high schools. I see. And... Uh, when you graduated from uh, Central High, did you go straight to college? I did. And was that at Bellhaven? I came to Bellhaven. Uh -huh. And that was at uh, 1958, I'm thinking. 54 no, was 54 when I came. I graduated 58. in 58, right. I had been the valedictorian in my class at Central and was offered a scholarship to every major school in the state. But I chose Bellhaven because it was a small school, and I had been in such a large high school, and I thought I would like to come here, and I was always glad. Well, you're still here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I came back to work here later, yes. <laughs> uh, that's terrific. Um, I know you've been a, a, a teacher uh, at 
many levels. And uh, uh, but I wondered what are some of your principal activities and interests other than your work? Are you like a gardener, or do you? Uh, uh, no, I'm no. not a gardener. Um, many people in my family are. Uh, I've been real interested in all the professional groups in education. I participated and was a leader in a good many of those, like, you know, the JEA and the MEA and the, the ADK and all of those groups, so I was real interested in that. Also, while I was going to college, I worked at the Baptist Hospital and I have continued uh, to work there um, ever since. I, this is my 59th year to work at the Baptist Hospital. I work uh, every weekend and every summer there. So that took a lot of my time and was a, one of my big interests. What were your duties at Baptist? Well, I was the room clerk uh, on the weekend for 25 years. In the last years, I've worked in the emergency room admitting and discharging people. And is that a, a professional occupation, or is that the volunteer work? Or? No, it's a, it's a job that I mm -hmm. had as a college student, and then I've just continued it. Um, but it's, it's not my profession. You know, I say my right. real job is teaching at Belhaven. And my other great interest have been the church. You know, I've taught Sunday school at my church since I was 15. I taught the five-year-olds for 25 years, and then I've taught the the couples class since then. What about mission work? Have you ever been involved in that? Um, no, I have, I've, except just helping get things ready for that and helping the missionaries. I did go to Spain once to help our missionary there because he was getting married, but that really wasn't mission work. <laughs> <laughs> but my other great thing I loved was traveling since I taught about all these countries. I wanted to go see them. And so uh, for a long time, I would try to go somewhere every summer that would be real interesting from the Holy Land to England to Ireland and all the states. And, you know, that was a great interest to me, mm -hmm. traveling. Tell me a little bit about your trip to the Holy Land. Well, I just thought it was the greatest experience of my life. I wouldn't give anything for having gone there. Um, I went in November of a year for two weeks, and most of the people with us were Baptist ministers who were, um, their church had given them that trip so they could get ready for Christmas. But, um, and Mr. Brian himself directed our tour because the pastor from his church was going. He wanted to make sure he got to see everything just so. So I always thought we got more than our money's worth because he was giving us so much uh, extra things. And seeing many of those places were, was just really great. Now this, I don't know if you want to hear this, you might want to cut some of this out, but anyway. We went to this place where Jesus would have been led when they were, cruci when they were uh, trying him. And they have beaten him and they bring him out and stand him on Pilate's floor. And that's the one thing that they're sure of, that that's where he was, because that floor is still there. They built a church over it, but Pilate's floor is still there. And they said to us, you know, Jesus stood right here. Now, we know he was many places, but we couldn't be sure he was right there giving the Sermon on the Mount, but you can be sure he was right here. And so somebody in the crowd said, could you swear that Jesus was right here? And our guide said, I couldn't swear he was right here then, but he's right here now. <laughs> and that was just the most sacred moment I've ever had to feel that, you know, and to be there. But we, um, one of the experiences I tell, we rode everything. We rode, you know, camels and donkeys. And, and when I was in Nazareth, this man came up and said, don't you want to ride a donkey like Mary? And I said, no. But he picked me up and put me on the donkey anyway. I was much younger and much smaller. And so I rode a whole mile down Nazareth on this donkey trying to get off, you know. And all my friends were walking along laughing at me. And so one of my friends here, when I came back and was telling that, said, you know, the Lord had a triumphal entry 
but Betty had a triumphal exit. <laughs> <laughs> so at my funeral, I want them to say, that's my triumphal exit, you know. Well, maybe they could pull your casket <laughs> in a donkey cart or something. No, they can just say, I've had my triumphal exit. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, could you just review for me um, your teaching career, just in a kind of a sketchy outline right now? I taught at Galloway uh, for eight years, the first grade, the fifth, and the sixth grade. And then uh, I was offered many jobs because I had won this award as the Outstanding Young Educator in America. And so Bellhaven offered me a job as did Millsap's MC, many other places. And I decided to come to Bellhaven because it had been my school. And I've been here 49 years. And my job here has mainly been to teach people who are going to be teachers. And I can, I was in charge of the student teachers for 25 years of that time that I've been here. So you've had quite an influence then on the Jackson schools so through the, well, the, the girls who came through your <laughs> I program. Also, I also taught for um, State and Ole Miss. When they had the R&D Center, they would have classes mm -hmm. there. I would teach for them. And I also did workshops from a Dougal Latale on how to teach English. And so I've had other jobs with other universities, but all the time. I've mainly been at Bellhaven. This is my main job. Okay. Um, let's turn our attention now to the church. You, oh, well, good. You okay. got there in uh, as a 12-year-old. Uh, through the Sunday school program, and uh, that was forty-seven. Yeah. I really went there in forty-five when I was ten. So uh, I, I was, um, I was going two years before I joined. I joined in forty-seven. Okay. Um, in nineteen sixty-three, I believe it was a number of Methodists. Uh, ministers signed a document about uh, racial justice in Mississippi. Keith Tonkel, who would become the uh, minister at Wells, had signed it uh, before he came. I wondered how aware you were of that uh, up uproar in the Methodist Church in the early 60s about racial justice issues. Well, we were very much aware of all that that was going on. At that time, I was teaching at Galloway, and Galloway was across the street from the church, as you know. But it, it's not a church school. Maybe we should uh, no, make that clear on it's the tape. A, it's one of the public schools. Right. But um, th this was the great time of integration, and the first school integrated in Mississippi in the public schools was Galloway. There was eight elementary schools in Jackson integrated in 64, 65, and that was, I was at Galloway at the time. So I was at the school when we were integrating the schools those first several years. And that was under the uh, freedom of choice operation where right. students could... The first two years, you could choose to go wherever you wanted. Then in the third year, they uh, paired schools and told everybody where they would have to go. But because of that, that would have affected uh, the neighborhood, uh, and that in a, in a way affected our church. But our church at the time was very aware of what was going on downtown, because people were trying to integrate First Baptist and Galloway, but no one was trying to integrate, integrate a little church like our church. And I don't think it would have been a problem had they come. Once when Keith came, he just said, anybody comes to our door and wants to worship, they're coming in. Nobody ever disagreed with that, you know. But the leadership of the church in 63 was not pushing for it, but they weren't pushing against it. You know, it was, they were just waiting to see how things were going to go. Now, prior to that, in the 50s, uh, a group had left Wales that had been there because of the literature. And so the people who probably would have objected had already gone because the ones who didn't like 
the what they thought was the liberalization of the literature had left to form a congregational church. So by the time Keith came, what was the excuse me? What was the liberalization that they objected to? I don't quite follow that. Well, uh, for a long time, uh, many of the Methodist churches could choose their literature, and our church, with a lot of others, chose that printed by David C. Cook, which was a real fundamentalist kind of regular literature. And then we got a new preacher who said he wanted us to use the literature printed in Nashville by the Methodist Church. And some people felt that that was not uh, as fundamental as David Cook's literature had been, and they objected to it for that reason. And, and this, this specified the, the forms of the prayers and things like that? Well, it, they just felt that it wasn't deep enough in theology that it just... Um, I don't. I, I was teaching in the the little children in Sunday school, and there wasn't much difference for what we did. You know, we were still teaching about David and Goliath, and and you, we were not doing heavy theology. So I don't know what was in the adult Sunday school class that they didn't like. It it was just in general during that time when people were questioning. Uh, the Bible and saying we needed different versions and and the older people at that church in those days were probably like those people that said if the King James Version is good enough for Jesus it's good enough for them. <laughs> they didn't understand about that. But anyway that had caused some people to go. So when uh, Keith came in 69 people that were there were people who were loyal to the church and they were loyal to um, the minister, whoever he was. I see. Well, um, the church is a small church, and it at that time, what was the neighborhood like that it was in? Well, our church began in 26, and the building was built in 27, and it was a totally neighborhood church. Bailey Avenue is a mile long and has three blocks uh, around it. And it was the third Methodist church in the city. First there was Galloway, Capitol Street. And then our church was formed in a home there and met in the school for a year, and then they built the building. And that's basically the same building that's there now. So it was just a neighborhood church. The trolley stopped at our church. Glendale Street was the end of the town. And our church was named Glendale in 26 until 47 it was named Glendale Methodist Church. And that's the street that's just on the north side of the church right. now. Right, yes. and that was the end of town when they built it. And so it was a little community church. And then in 32, Brother Wells came, Jim Wells came to be the preacher. And he brought a kind of real evangelistic kind of movement to the church so that more people began joining it. But the church had a real hard time in the 30s because it was the Depression, and they were just frightened that they might lose it. I mean, they were having a hard time paying their mortgages during the 30s, and, um, and they felt it was just a real answer to prayer every month that they were able to keep that church until the war came, and then the war changed the economy. And then after the war, a lot of people moved into that area, and the town moved north. And so there were more people who could come to the church. And I don't, I think there were three or 400 people going there in the 40s, and that's when I first went there, was in the 40s. And there was a, a Baptist church down the street and a Church of God street, church across the street. And it was a very religious little community. Um, and then in the... Uh, in 47, a Brother Wells, who had been there 15 years and was our longest running pastor until Keith, um, was killed in a car accident. And then he, um, the next year, they uh, voted to change the name to Wells Memorial in his honor because he had taken them through that real hard time and had kept the church alive. Uh, they thought his ministry had, and the Lord had kept the church alive during that time. And then our next preacher continued in the same style of preaching as Brother Wells 
for the next eight or nine years, maybe. When you say evangelistic, uh, could you describe what you mean by that? Well, we would have um, we would have revivals in those days. Many churches had revivals, and we'd have one in the spring and the fall. That last a week or two weeks, and people would come every night, and and there would be big crowds. You know, would come, and um, and that continued into the fifties. There was this unusual revival they had in 1950 uh, where these college students came down in January to tell their testimony you know and we had a revival every night for um, a month and people came from everywhere in the city like that's when Central was the only school everybody from Central came and I run into people now all the time that tell me they became Christians in 1950 at that revival, you know, and that was meant there were about 15 people became preachers from that revival that we could name some of those for you. And then that was, uh, I guess, the, the high point of the church then. And then as the community changed and people began to move out, then that group who didn't think the church was having revivals enough. I guess they the, thought we were becoming liberal. They moved out, so by the time Keith got there, we were very small. Um, now, sometimes he just says there were 15 people there when he came, but that's not true. There were about 60, <laughs> and there were, but it was a small crowd compared to what it had been, mm -hmm. and the ones who came were faithful, but there just weren't a lot of them who came, and there were no children only my family had some children there because the people who lived in the neighborhood had moved out and they're the ones who had the children so we had this great high in the 50s and then it went down to when maybe right before Keith came was our lowest point you know when they were people were moving and then they were just going to the churches that were in the places where they were because it had been a community church and now it wasn't, you know. There. So the the evangelistic movement was designed to to add people to the church to bring and it people did. without churches into the church or to, to convert people who who were looking for something right. religious to. Uh, and under several of the preachers, like Brother Case, Brother Wells, you know, then they that had happened, you know. And then. Um, each, the preachers who came after that, each had their own agendas, and so that would make some people come and some people leave, you know, as, as I'm sure that happens in other churches too, but most of the other churches on that street dissolved. You know, Crestwood, which had been a real huge Baptist church, moved out. The Church of God moved out. The Four Square Gospel Church, so we were the only church left as a church that had been there uh, for years, you know. And that was because of the movements of populations right. further north. And yeah, the people were just moving. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, some of those churches were uh, were bought by other churches, like the, the Mount Sinai Baptist brought the Church of God, which is across the street from us. And then Crestwood was empty for years and years. And now the Baptists use it as a mission church. And then the Church of God of Prophecy was, was a part of that Church of God. You know, that's a, a church on the other side of the school. But in my childhood, you know, almost every block had a church on it and everybody went to church. Mm -hmm. But as the community changed, the, the inner city churches changed. And I think our church and Calvary were the only two inner city churches that continued. Was there a lot of concern within the, the church community for the the loss of memberships and was there discussion of perhaps moving as well? Um, our church never really discussed moving that I can remember but we had different preachers who felt that maybe it might be time to close it. You know we had one preacher right before Keith that thought there was no real hope 
for it ever being a community church again, and they didn't know why people would want to come into the inner city, you know, if there was no special program there, because they had been preachers who had been a part of community churches. And I guess that the thought was that's the only time there would be, you know, to have a church that draws people from everywhere, like our church now draws people from 50 miles away, and people come for the program, not because it's a community church, you know, but it was in the beginning, uh, you know, a little community church. When uh, Keith Tunkel came to the church, do you remember the uh, the impetus for that? Was it just kind of a, a normal movement of one preacher from somewhere to somewhere else, or was there a special call that went out? Or? Well, we don't know how we got Keith to start with. We were very thankful because those of us who were there and who wanted to stay there and wanted to keep the church going were afraid that if we didn't have some real young and vital person, the church would go to naught, you know. And so we loved Keith's spirit, that he um, it didn't bother him that it was just a few people. He was going to work with what was there. And he felt the Lord had sent him there for a special purpose, and we did too. And the first several years he was there, we kept thinking they're going to send him somewhere else because he was like 33, I think, when he came, and just a real vibrant preacher and in demand to preach at a lot of places. You know, he he would go do uh, spiritual emphasis weeks and speak on college campuses, and he had a radio program and a TV program, and we knew we just couldn't, we, we were too small for him, but we were just so thankful that he was willing to stay, you know, at a church that was small and not growing very much to start with. But because he had these other contacts in colleges and in speaking in other places, people began to come over to hear what his ministry was, and then some of them stayed, and the, and the church then began to grow. But it took several years, you know, for that to go. And as you know, in the Methodist Church, they often move preachers every four years. So four years was not going to be enough for us to have a big turnaround. And so we were so thankful that he was able to stay more years there until there could be this turnaround. When he first came, did he talk a lot about the... Uh the, the vision that he had for the church or what his style of ministry might be? Um, well, he always felt that we should go on. He wasn't like the preacher who said, we're going to close it if we don't do this, you know. Uh, he was always optimistic about things and willing to start new things and um, wanted there to be somebody there for any and any kind of meeting we were going to have. Whether there were going to be 10 there or 100, he was going to be there. And everybody was welcome however they wanted to dress or whoever they were. Um, we always knew that, you know. Um, so I think it was his spirit more than what he said. But if you've ever listened to him preach, you know, he preaches not from the lectionary, which is a book that tells preachers what would be good to preach this week so that you would eventually preach everything that's in the Bible. But Keith always preached about whatever was happening. You know, whatever was going on in the town, that would be a topic for the sermon. Something would happen, somebody would say something, and he would say, well, that'll preach. And then that would be a sermon based on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he still does that. You know, he still... His sermons will be based on events of the time. And they'll still be grounded in the scripture, but they're really relevant. And I think that's what made a lot of the young people from the colleges start coming, is that he was not the traditional uh, preacher that was doing an exegesis, but he was speaking to the problems of the times. When he came, I understand there were already some outreach programs uh, going on in the church was missionary work or one that gets mentioned in particular 
is the Operation Shoestring. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Right before Keith came, uh, our minister, Gilbert, uh, was very interested in helping the neighborhood. And his uh, wife had a little daycare for the black children in our basement. And a lady named Nancy Gilbert, who was not a relative, wanted to use our church as a basis to help the neighborhood people by showing them how they could get food stamps, how they could get help from the government, and she needed a basis for that. And so our church was the basis. We gave her several rooms there, and she worked with this. That was the beginning of Operation She's Dream. And was she a member of your church? She was not a member of I our see. church. Mm -hmm. In fact, her father was the head of the Baptist Convention Board. Oh, wow. And I think she did it as a rebellion against him, but don't say that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, she was very interested. Her husband was a lawyer, and they were very interested in helping uh, the black people get their legal rights and helping them find other things, and the church was going to help. And she was only there about a year before Keith came. And so Keith became real interested in her ministry and said, well, if we're going to do that for him, why don't we do something else for him too? So every Thursday they organized and we had a clinic and we got different doctors to volunteer and come over and they would do blood pressures and all of that for the people and refer people who needed help. They would find a doctor for them to go to and help them with that. And then we, uh, we started a tutorial program for the children to come over after school. And Operation Shoestring worked out of our church for many years. I don't know the exact number but they do. And then eventually it became its own organization in which our church was a member of their board, but they are a separate group now. And as you know, they're about four blocks down the street from yes. us. Mm -hmm. But for many years in the summer, we would go down and do Bible schools for them and fix breakfast and do devotionals for Operation Shoestring. And, um, and then that led us to also doing our pantry where we would give out food every week to the neighborhood people that um, were in need. And I think now we give out about 150 bags of groceries every week. So generally a, a, a program to meet the physical needs of people who were less affluent, who are uh, looking for medical care, clothing, food, and daycare, I guess. Was that part of it? Um, not since 1970, but prior to that, we did have some there. Mm -hmm. um, because then Operation Shoe Dream took that over, you know. Mm -hmm. And they do have an after school care and other programs. But other churches in town have also helped with Operation Shoe Dream, which we think is was a good thing. But it was started in our church. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, we were always um, encouraging any of the neighborhood people who want to come to our church to come, and some come, but some already had their churches around there, and and we didn't want to try to pull them away from, let's say, the church that was across the street, but we always wanted them to feel welcome at our church, and there have been members there I would say since 1970. Um, we probably, other than the Voice of Calvary, would be the most diverse of the churches, you know, that have black and white people. Mm -hmm. So there was a, even before Keith came, there was a, a recognition that of the, need. the need was there in the neighborhood. So if you're going to be a neighborhood church, you had to begin to meet those needs. Right. Um, are there any one or two things about um, Keith's approach to ministry that struck you as uh, special or important or just individual? Uh, well, Keith always wanted to be called Keith. You know, everybody we'd ever had before had to be brother so-and-so, you know, a reverend, or doctor so-and-so. He, he was just one of us. He just wanted to be called Keith. And he wanted to call everybody else their name. And at first that was a shocking thing to us that some of the older members, and a lot of them were real old when Keith came. 
he would call Mr. Akers Carl. None of us would have ever dared do that. Mr. <laughs> Akers was, the, you know, was the patriarch of our church, you know. But they liked it, you know. I mean, he called everybody by their name. And uh, nobody really had titles. I thought that was an interesting thing that, that he did that made people love him. And the young people, I think, especially liked that, you know. Um, he, um, he wanted to include as many people, and this is why he was willing to stay with us, is that we didn't have a lot of members for him to take care of. So he could do radio programs and he could do uh, the TV. You know, he's been on the Methodist Hour all these years. And he could um, act this for two or three weeks every month for many years. He would be somewhere doing a, a spiritual emphasis week or a three-day revival. So we were sharing him, you know, with many groups of people. And I w but we never felt he neglected us in any way when he would be out doing that. And in fact, that would often pull people in to our church. Um, and then in 85, we decided, he decided that we really needed to do something to help the property because it had not had much done to it over the years. And so we completely renovated it. But we kept the spirit of the church so we didn't change the stained glass windows or we didn't change any of the the style of it. We just made it firm and better. Before he came, I thought it was real interesting that the one wing that was put on our church was put on in the 40s, and we had a kitchen. And we were the second church in Mississippi to have a kitchen mm -hmm. because most churches had a fellowship hall, but they didn't have a kitchen because some people thought it was wrong to cook in the church. I always thought that was interesting because now every church, I guess, has a kitchen. I guess the little country churches don't. But then when we remodeled, we made our kitchen better. But then in the 40s, they had a great argument. I guess it was the 50s. They had a great argument in the 50s whether or not they should air condition the church because churches weren't air conditioned. The only thing in the, the 50s that were air conditioned were the movies and the 10 cent stores. <laughs> and, you know, that was one of the reasons that people during the civil rights region area wanted to go to Woolworths. It was the only place in town that was cool. You know, they were integrating the counter. But none of the churches were air conditioned either. And we bought the old Woolworth air conditioner and put it in our church. And it stayed there 20 years maybe. But I just couldn't believe there'd be some people against air conditioning the church. And they said, if we air conditioned it, people would come just to get cool. <laughs> I just thought that was so funny. <laughs> but now I don't think people would think of building something that wasn't air conditioned. Just imagine that. See, that was in the 50s mm -hmm. when everything was hot. And I just, and we were one of the first churches to have air conditioning. I don't know what other churches had it at that time, but I know not many had it. Did anybody ask if they wanted to live without fans? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, our windows had to open like this, and now they're sealed, too, you know. But, yeah. no, we had fans up there. We just didn't have air conditioning. And um, and somebody said, well, if we didn't air condition, people would go to the movies on Sunday to get cool. So that's why they voted. <laughs> they didn't want to go into the movies on Sunday, so we voted to have air conditioning. So when, Pop, when Keith got there, we were air conditioned. Uh, there were, um, there's a, a, Wells has talked about as having a spirit of uh, inclusiveness, that everybody's welcome. Are there any aspects of that that you'd like to uh, point out or call attention to? Well, um, first we were a very traditional church, you know, it was all families, people lived in the community. And then after Keith came, what was happening was not only integration, but the hippie movement was afoot. And um, in the 70s, see, I don't know if anybody else would remember this, you had to dress up to go to church. And the hippies were wearing long hair and blue jeans and sandals or no shoes at all or whatever. And a lot of churches in town were turning away the young people because they were dressing, you know, 
as the times was. And we were one of the first churches, if not the first, that would say you could come in in your blue jeans. Now, I'm sure many churches go in their blue jeans now, but they didn't in 1970. And we were one of the first churches that people would come, and they had their long hair and their blue jeans or their sandals. and, And they would come from other churches in town where their families were members, and they wanted to go to church, but they also wanted to be their own people and wear their hippie clothes, I guess, I don't know what. Anyway, although Keith himself is always very formal, he always made all those people feel welcome, and you could come in whatever clothing you had on, as long as it was decent, you know. And and we did get a lot of people that came to our church in the 70s because they were allowed to come in their ordinary clothes. And if you come to our church now, you're going to see some people dressed up, and you're going to see some people look like they're going out to work in the garden, you know, because... Mm-hmm. Uh, however you want to come, you're welcome. And I guess that was the first inclusiveness um, that made everybody feel uh, welcome. And one time we had this little old lady in our church. She was 90-something and was our oldest member and was a very prim and proper little lady. And she always wore her gloves and her hat. And So I was in the balcony and I looked down and here was a little Miss White at the at communion and on each side of her were these twins dressed like hippie I mean they were hippies the long hair and one of them was barefoot and the other one had on sandals and they were holding hands with little Miss White down at the communion and I thought now that is the real gospel you know that's that's real inclusiveness everybody is together there it didn't bother her and I guess it didn't bother them that she was all dressed up because We were all there together, you know, and Mm -hmm. that was a real interesting time to me when the church. And then in the, during that time, we also had some uh, people integrating the church, but it was never a big issue. You know, people came, uh, they were welcome. Some of the first to come were little children, which we thought was proper. You know, our children were um, integrated there maybe before some of the upper groups were integrated. And some of the very first people to come um, as part of the integration were college students. And that was of interest to me because, see, I taught here in a college and I knew a lot of my students would go there and they would feel welcome because whether they were black or white, we knew we could invite them to come and they would be welcome there. Which wasn't true in many Mm-hmm. churches in town, you know. Well, at the time, you, you were teaching at Bellhaven at the time, and was Bellhaven integrated then? Bellhaven has never not been integrated. I like to tell this point. Bellhaven's charter said it was a school for young women. In 1954, they changed it to say it would be co-ed, it would be a school for men and women. Our charter never said white. Ole Miss said white. Jackson State said you had to be black. Bellhaven just said you had to be a woman, or and then eventually it said you had to be a woman and a man. You could be both. So we, people, anytime anybody applied to Bellhaven, they could come, because we didn't have to change anything. See, all the other schools had to change their charter and say, these people are welcome or these people are not welcome. Well, when anybody applied to Bellhaven, they could come. So we were some of the very first to have integrated classes because if anybody applied, there was no question there was that you couldn't come or, you know. And in the 1970s, when many places were just getting started, Bellhaven had a black girl from Hattiesburg as our student body president. I think it was maybe in 74, you know. And that's before most of the colleges really had much integration going on. And... Uh, our president now is, you know, very proud of the fact that we have a high percentage of our students are black as well as we have a lot of Orientals too. You know, we're, we're a real diverse campus. Mm-hmm. So the college really was ahead of uh, a number of other 
uh, similar institutions in, in Mississippi? Well, um, it's, it never had to be an issue because, mm -hmm. you know, and they, however, this is just a real odd and strange thing. Bellhaven was Scottish. So the word clan, C-L-A-N, is very Scottish. So many of our things were the clan calls, see that's Scottish. And our basketball team was the clan's men, which is Scottish. But then when our president came in the 70s, he said, we can't have a team called the Klansmen. It sounds too much like the K-L-A-N, you know. Right. And so we had to change our name, even though it was there for a good reason. It was there for the Scottish heritage. We couldn't keep it, so we're the Blazers now, you know. Mm -hmm. And we had to get rid of that. I mean, it was strange to have a basketball team with black boys on it and it be called the Klansmen. <laughs> that would be... <laughs> Anyway, that was probably our biggest our biggest concern was changing our name, you know, so because our newspaper was called the Klan Call, so well, then we just changed it to something right. else, the Blazon or something. Well, to, to get back to uh, Wells. Keith Tonkel and Wells, uh, how would you say he was able to bring so many members of the church with him on some of these initiatives? What was his leadership style? Did he involve a lot of people in making decisions, or did he just announce what was going to happen? I don't know. Um, he always involved people, although he always felt real sure, you know, of what he was doing. What I felt is, I felt he was really led of the Lord. I think most of the people felt he was a very spiritual person and that he was right there where the Lord put him and he wanted to do the Lord's work. I don't I don't think we ever thought anything he did was to advance his career. In fact he is extremely humble about all of that. And so if he did have things he wanted us to do, we never felt it was in any way to advance him or or his career. He always wanted to do what would be best for our people and what would be best in the kingdom of the Lord. And I don't I don't think very many people questioned his leadership because he was open to hear what you had to say, although he felt very strong about certain things. Um, so it was more that they, um, in a conviction of, of his his moral rectitude, his um, religious vision, that people wanted to well, you know, to participate in something they thought was right. Keith is a terribly hard worker. You know, he is working every minute. He would be over there Sunday morning picking up the paper out in front of the church if somebody had thrown out something. When we... When he first came there, we didn't have any real staff. He would be sweeping out the fellowship hall. He would be cleaning up the bathrooms. He was working hard all the time. How could you criticize anybody who's willing to work hard like that all the time? He was just an indefatigable person. And so he would never ask us to do anything. He was not already in there doing himself. And I think that may be a part of his leadership is he was willing to work real hard, and you wanted to work hard too, because you see he was doing that. Um, and he won, and we knew many times he could have gone to uh, other churches, and we expected him to go up and eventually have the biggest church in Mississippi. He could have done that. He turned it down. We always asked for him to come back. What was amazing is he would say he was willing <laughs> to come back. He always felt there was still more to do or mm -hmm. there was something else that we could do or he wanted to continue the program we had. And that's what, to me, was the amazing thing. Not that we wanted to keep him, because who wouldn't want to keep him, but that he wanted to stay with us. And and our, our programs grew and grew and grew, you know. You're going to list in a while all the different programs we have. And when you think about that little bitty church doing a whole variety of things, I think it is 
really amazing how the Lord has led and blessed that because most little churches would only have one or two of those projects and we just have a slew of them and people work at them. Well, tell, tell me about one or two of those that you feel most important or most important. Well, you know, we've done that Wells Fest that somebody else will speak to that. Every year it gets bigger and more people help us. It takes more people to run and then we even have members, I think. But people just volunteer their friends and their friends come and help it. But we have always given all the money away and I think that's an amazing thing. Many people have projects and they use it to improve their own church grounds or their own church program and except for that first time when we used it to finish our build rebuilding our church we have given every bit of it away every penny of it away and i think that's an amazing thing that a little church will give sixty thousand dollars to some other community service um and that our church works so hard on that people work on that like it was their main job you know, and the people, once they get started in it, running the coffee house or selling the hamburgers or doing the children's work, they're just, uh, they're just engaged in it, like somebody's paying them a big salary to do it, and they're not. But I don't know how that spirit got started, but it's there, you know. Um, and I, I think that's amazing. And then when our people started going to Mexico, that was a great thing, too. We would have... 10, 12 people or go down and help build that building in Mexico and they took, it was a medical mission we took a lot of nurses and doctors went down there and dentists went down there and helped with those people and I, until it just got too dangerous in the last year or two to go down there um, I think it was amazing how much they were able to help that little town of Talamit and some of those people came up here and we got to see them which was they got to we got to know how our church really did affect them there. Do you know how that began? How it got started? Uh, there was a, a a man in the Methodist conference that was doing missions in Mexico, and he came up and talked to our church to see if any of our church would be interested. Uh, Keith could tell you his name because he went with us several times, and he's a part of the conference that takes missions to different parts of the hemisphere. And um, but uh, Dr. McElwain was the doctor who first started going down there. I mean, then we had a lot of nurses volunteer to go uh, because it was a medical mission at first, and we took a lot of medicines down there for them. You know, ordinary medicines that you could give diabetics and things like that, not hard hard drugs. You know, but just the other kind of medicines that they needed for heart and blood pressure and all of that. But then they were they helped build the clinic, and like uh, several men in my Sunday school class went down. They were electricians, and they wired it. One year they went down and wired that whole thing, and then other years people went down and painted it. And so it was really on the ground work that the people did in Delamic. But you should have some of those speak to, about that. Who <laughs> I, I know Keith Ferguson went a lot. Greg Campbell went down. Um, Greg Campbell went down and took pictures of all the children and gave it to them. And that's the first pictures most of those children ever had of themselves or to give their parents. And, like, that's a ministry our church does. We go across the street, and Greg takes a picture of all the children at Galloway, puts them in little folders that say Merry Christmas. And each of those children have those pictures to give their parents as a present because most of them have never had a formal picture taken mm -hmm. and Greg's been doing that many years the church I think helps pay for the material and Greg gives his time to do that I think it it might be really hard to think of all the little things that people do because they think of something to do and then they get a little group and do it you know like mm -hmm. a little group goes to the prisons and we had that ministry for a, a while I went out to one of the prisons for several years and taught um, these six men how to read who didn't know how to read. But they came to our church first, and we did a Bible study, and they asked how could we help them, and they said if we could teach them how to read. Now, they have a program in prisons 
for the GED, but there are people in prison who can't read on the third grade reading level, and they needed somebody to help on the lower level. That's what we were doing for a while. But I just can't remember all the things. Over the years, as a need arises, somebody would step in and do it, you know, and um, some of them developed into long-term projects. Some of them were just short-term projects. Were there any other things about Wells Church that you think are important that we uh, pass along to people in later times? Well, um, I don't know. Um, of course, it's been my main church all my life, you know. I've been there um, 69 years. And so I, I tell people I've been here 49, at the Baptist Hospital 59, and at my church 69, and on earth 79. Those are my notes. <laughs> Next year I'm going to roll them all over, I hope. <laughs> of course, I think it's a wonderful church. I've loved all the, the people that I've known there, just some of the most wonderful people in the world. Uh, have been members there and we have been privileged to know them and work with them in many other places and I think for a, such a little church we have such a wide variety of people I mean we have some of the most educated people in town doctors and lawyers and, and just uh, people who are janitors and everybody is the same to everybody there you know and I think that's such an interesting thing too. Well, let me ask you this um, to many people outside of Mississippi Mississippians are generally conceived to be racist and exclusionist. And is there a way you can account for the fact that this church exemplifies the opposite of that in so many ways? Is there something special about the people at this church, or is there a misconception about the way Mississippians are in general? Um, what would you say? Well, I think that in the past, some of our politicians have given us such a bad name because of how they have spoken. And I think some of the church leaders in the beginning did not speak up. But I think what our church has stood for is what the gospel is. You know, I mean, I think uh, we're not any different than any church ought to be because this is what Jesus says. He, he says the gospel is for everybody, the Greek and the Roman and the everybody, men and women and the educated and the uneducated and our church just tried to make that be real you know um, but I do think every time I've traveled out of the side of Mississippi we are, have been asked questions like that you know um, because our, in the past we had too many people who spoke and they thought they were speaking for all of Mississippi but, you know, Mississippi has more churches per population than any other state. Mississippi is the poorest state in the Union, and it gives more money to charity than any other state. And that must say, why? Why do we give more to charity? And it's because we're Christians. But maybe it's because the Christians are not vocal enough, you know. And it is good if our church can have some voice and say, this is really what Christianity is. Christianity is all-inclusive. Christianity is giving, you know, loving and sharing, as Keith likes to say. And and I don't think Keith is the only Methodist preacher that thinks that. I think many of them do. But I think the fact that he's been at one church that long is makes what he says have more power. You know, it, is, it makes it more unusual. And there have been other preachers who've been at churches 20 or 30 years, but I don't think anybody has been at any church in a, in a main denomination for 45 years. That just has to be some kind of special <laughs> record. <laughs> well, Betty, we've spent over an hour now together, and I think... Uh, I'll cut out any of this. You <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to thank you very much for your well, participation. Well, cut out the part about me, because I didn't want to talk about me. And just put in the part about the church, because I've always been uh, a great advocate for our church. And I always said, whoever the minister was, I wanted to be there. You know, it's my church. And in those few years when we were having hard times, 
I was glad that there were some other people who felt like I did. We were going to stick with it. And we've been vindicated because the, it, it did come back and become a real great lighthouse, I think, in the, in the community, maybe in the world, because we've sent people out all over the world. Well, I think that's a good note to end on. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. I hope we didn't bore you. Too.